So I thought we would start with fasting and prayer for the Buffalo Bills game this week. And <laughs> yeah, not so good last week. Turns out the Bills melt in the heat. We didn't see that coming. Thrilled that you're here today. This is our fourth Sunday in looking at the Gospel of Matthew. And we're taking a deep dive into what is the first of four Gospels given to us that describe and define who Jesus was, why he came, what he did. And so this morning we're in Matthew chapter 3, and beginning in the first verse it says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey, a little different than the donuts and bagels we have. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but, when John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, the heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. John the baptizer would have been perfect for YouTube. Everything about this guy just demanded attention. Uh, he was eccentric in his diet choices and in his uh, clothing style. He was loud, not easy to ignore. He was harsh. When he saw religious people coming to the baptismal services, he referred to them as a brood of vipers. How many know that has never been a compliment in any culture? Like that, that's just not a thing you think is a good thing. And he seems un, unnecessarily hyper-focused on fire. Like he talks about it all the time. The trees that are not bearing fruit are going to be cut down. What are we going to do with them? We're going to burn them with fire. Uh, we're going to separate the wheat from the chaff. What are we going to do with the chaff? We're going to burn them with fire. The Messiah is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Like <laughs> this guy was a little focused on fire. What's interesting is that all four gospel writers tell the story of Jesus' baptism, and all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, make a reference to a prophecy from Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet, who foretold that there would be a person like John and the work that he would do. He would, he would speak hope to people. In fact, Isaiah, the 40th chapter, is where this comes from, and this is what it says, comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly. John didn't quite have the tenderly part down, but speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make 
uh, straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's a message of hope. It's a message that things will not always be as they are right now. John was the voice that would precede the Messiah. Both Isaiah and another Old Testament prophet named Malachi, uh, they were both foretelling of John's coming. And the Old Testament promised that someone would, would say, the next person after me, they're the one. The salvation that we've longed for, the salvation that we've prayed for, it's almost here. And that's what John is doing. Matthew is reminding us again, God is with us. So here's a point that I want you to see. Preparing does not make the word of, work of God possible. It gets us ready for it. Sometimes we think that God is limited by our actions or inactions. And the simple truth is, is not that we can keep God from doing something that he has planned to do. The question is, will we participate in what he is doing? And so we're called to prepare. God's kingdom is coming whether we're prepared or not, but there are things we can do to prepare for that. So John said, one of the things you can do is baptism, baptism in water. Now what you have to appreciate is in that culture, in Jewish culture, it was unheard of that Jewish people would be baptized. The only people that went through a baptism in the ancient Jewish culture were Gentiles who wanted to come into the Jewish faith. And so there were multiple things that they needed to do in order to come into the Jewish faith. Some of them only the husband or the leader of the house could do. But baptism was something that every single member of the house would engage in. There was like this kind of public bath that they would participate in. And this public bath had a pic it was a picture of something. And it was a picture of an Old Testament story. And the Old Testament story was as Egypt uh, had enslaved God's people for hundreds of years, when God's people came out, the nation of Israel came out, they got as far as the Red Sea, and that's where Pharaoh had a change of heart and a change of mind, and he sent his entire army after them in order to bring them back into slavery. And God opened a way in the Red Sea, and when they came out the other end, they weren't slaves anymore. Now they were a nation unto God. And so the picture of baptism is you're, you're leaving a life of slavery, and now you're entering into a life of a new nation for God a new kingdom. That was the picture. And every member of a family in the Gentile household would have been baptized. And this is an important thing for us. Water baptism is for everyone. Water baptism is for everyone. Now, John was calling Jewish people to baptism. Once again, unheard of. And he would tell them, repent, get ready for this new kingdom that God is bringing. And John insisted that being aware of spiritual truth or being raised in a spiritual family was not enough. That if you wanted to enter into God's kingdom, it wasn't just the Bible verses that you could remember or the family that you were raised in, that something else was necessary. The key was repentance, repentance. The baptism of Jesus is told by all four Gospels. And multitudes are being baptized into, by John, and they were all admitting their sins, which raises a question, and it has really serious theological implications. Why did Jesus go to be baptized? Because there's a theological doctrine that says the only way that Jesus could pay for anyone else's sins is if he had no sin. Once you are guilty of sin, then all you can do is try to pay down your own sin. You can't really pay for anyone else's sin. So why would Jesus need to be baptized in water? Because according to our understanding of Scripture, he had not sinned. What does Jesus need to repent 
of? This is a fair question, right? So the, the, this is the, the first indication, actually, that we have of Jesus identifying with other sinners. We all know that the, the end of Jesus' life is on a cross between two thieves, but we forget that the beginning of his ministry is in a river among other sinners. Jesus is already identifying with us. It, he is God with us. So this is what we need to understand. John called people to repentance. And usually when we think about repentance, we think about regret and we think about remorse. We associate repentance with a feeling. When Jesus comes, John looks at him. We know from other gospels, he has a very clear indication in this moment of who Jesus is. And he says, I should not be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus gives a really interesting response. He says, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. What are we seeing? The way Jesus sees repentance, and honestly, the way I think John sees repentance, is it's not just feeling bad about things that you've done. There are lots of people who feel bad about things that they've done and they do them again. Well, let me see here. How many have ever done something that you regretted? How many ever was about to do something that you pre-gretted? You just knew this was, and you did it anyway, didn't you? <laughs> you did. See, repentance is not limited to regret. It tells us in 2 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, that godly sorrow can lead to repentance. It does not say godly sorrow is repentance. And the Apostle Paul would go on to say there's a worldly sorrow that actually leads to death. Sometimes in, in religious world, what we want people to do is feel really bad about things that they have done. And sometimes when people are feeling bad, what they're feeling is a worldly sorrow, and it actually has the opposite effect of what God intends. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Repentance can include a recognition that things that I've done have not been good, and I feel sorrow about that, but it's also a determination to fulfill God's plan for my life. Baptism is a declaration that we want to submit to God's plans, God's agenda, God's goal for our life. Water baptism says, I believe in God and I will surrender to his plan for my life. In fact, it's kind of a picture. Uh, baptism is often a picture of burial and resurrection. Right? We lower people down into the water as though they're being buried. In fact, the Apostle Paul would use that phrase later on in Scripture. We're buried with Christ in baptism. Being buried. What are you dying to? My old way of life. My insistence that I'm going to call the shots. And then we're raised in the newness of life in Christ. And now what we're saying is, I don't want to be the one calling all the shots in my life. I want God directing my paths. I want God's plan for my life, not just my plan. Baptism is not just about being sorry. It's about a commitment. I want God to be in charge of my life. That begins with baptism. Now, here's the thing. I've been doing ministry a long time. And they tell me ministry is like dog years, so it's even longer than you think. <laughs> and this is what I know. Lots of people have reasons why they don't enter the waters of baptism. I'm too old. I'm afraid. I weigh too much. I'm too skinny. They've got all these, I'm afraid of water. All these, all these things that people, I don't want to be seen by other people. Can't I just go in the shower at home and just tell God, just count this. Just and the, <laughs> the answer is that doesn't count. I'll show you in just a minute. That actually doesn't count. All the reasons we can come up with to not be baptized are the same kind of reasons that keep us from 
preparing for what God wants to do in our lives. The rationale we use to not be baptized, those same reasons pop up in lots of other things. And we wind up being paralyzed from watching the kingdom of God being lived out in our lives. So Jesus is simply saying, I am going to be, this is his opening declaration of ministry, I will be obedient to the will of God. That's all I want in my life. And he goes into the waters of baptism and he says this, because John says, I don't want to do this. And he says, this is what he says, let it be so now. It's proper, listen to this, for us to do this. He did not say it's proper for me to do this. Even in baptism, Jesus is insisting that there's a communal aspect. I know there are people who would prefer a spiritual life that is lone ranger in its orientation. This kind of self-sufficiency that if I read the Bible enough and I pray enough, I don't need anybody else. That version of Christianity is not in the Bible. That's a perversion of Christianity. God refuses to establish a community of faith where we do not need each other. If your goal in your spiritual life is to get to a place where you don't need anybody but God, you are pursuing a goal of spiritual life you cannot find in Scripture. You can find it in our culture. We value independence above almost anything, but you can't find it in Scripture. And these are actually the first recorded words we have of Jesus as an adult. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus partners with John because you don't baptize yourself. He, you, you put into a watery grave the idea that you don't need anyone else in your spiritual life. So how do you prepare for God in your life? It's a good question. And one of the things we see out of this story of Jesus is that you admit what is true about you. Admit what is true about you. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. In 1 John, the first chapter and the ninth verse, it tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We cannot prepare for God's will in our lives by hiding our faults or by rationalizing our actions or by blaming other people for our behavior. We can admit, we can admit we're having a hard time doing the right thing. We can admit that we have a hard time finding the right reasons. We can admit that we don't like to change. Our primary problem in our culture, please hear this, our primary problem in our culture is not other people. It's not, it's not our culture. It's not those people or that, the, that group or those politicians or whatever else it is, that's not the problem. Our problem is not which side of a political aisle you're on. Our problem is that we don't like to admit what is true about us. It starts in confession. If anyone who's been part of a 12-step program knows that you cannot get healthier and stronger by blaming uh, others for the way that you're behaving. He says, Jesus says, uh, or John says, who warned you about God's wrath? And nobody likes to talk about God's wrath, but we really should think about this. So what is it that makes God angry? That would be worth knowing. And a lot of us have been taught that when you step out of bounds, that really makes God angry. What is it that makes God angry? Well, the truth is, is that his wrath is part of the good news. Why would that be part of the good news? Because where there is injustice, because where there are people taken advantage of, because where there are people being harmed, should God not care about that? And the reason he cares about it is because he actually loves people. I mean, I was watching the, the football game last Sunday 
I did confess some things to God. I'm not going to confess them to you. But there was a quarterback at the opposing team that went down. And when he got up, he couldn't walk. And do you know what I did not do? I'm a little surprised, but I did not go, oh, we got him. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that. I said, get him out of there. He's hurt. Don't let him get hurt anymore. And he was out like for half a minute and then he came back in. And God loves each and every one of his children, even the ones that do not follow him. And when he sees pain brought to them and when he sees injustice done to them, it breaks his heart and it makes him angry. God is not angry because you've broken one of his rules. God is angry when one of his children are broken by someone else. We have to start with admitting what's true about us. And then secondly, we have to submit to God's direction. What does God want to do in your life? What is his plan? Not what is your plan? Will you obey his voice? Or will you stop listening to what he has to say? Um... Sometimes we'll, we'll go to God, which car should I buy? I don't think God is as concerned about which car you buy as how you use your car once you own it. The very first car I ever bought, the very first Sunday, it was brand new. It was brand new. It was brand new. <laughs> Did I say it was brand new? I don't know how newer it could be. I had driven it off the lot of the dealership the day before. And the next morning, I was picking up some people to go to church. And I watched as a little child got into the back seat of my, did I mention it was a brand new car? <laughs> and he had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I thought to myself, this is not going to end well. In one ride, he's going to turn my brand new car into a crap car. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> he smudged that into the fabric in ways that I have no idea how he could actually pull that off. And peanut butter is, is an interesting thing. When it gets down into something, it's, it's got kind of a grease and oil to it. Every day for the rest of the time that I owned that car, which was quite a long time, I would get into the car and look in the back seat, and there was evidence <laughs> of that little demoniac that I let in the car. <laughs> and it'd be so easy, so easy to go, yeah, I'm not picking people up anymore. They need to clean their act. They need to eat before they get up. Start in your house. Eat at home. Then, then get in the car. But you know what? I was back next Sunday picking them up again. Because how we use our car is way more important than which car you selected to buy. How you behave in school is more important than which school you went to. How you work at your job is more important than which job you took. A lot of people, one of their big questions, there's, there's just some things, there's two things everybody wants to know. Is, is, uh, they want to know stuff about the end times, and they want to know stuff about sex. And young adults want to know, will there be sex in the end times? <laughs> <laughs> And there's, there's, this, there's this high focus. I get it. I get it. I, I don't want to marry the wrong person. Nobody ever thinks I want to be the right person when I get married. The success of your marriage is not your decision-making ability. I mean, don't get me wrong. You can, you, you can make poor choices. There's usually red flags about that. But the question is how... The question is not, how can my spouse be a better person? The question is, how can I be a better spouse? No. How does God respond to repentance and baptism? One, one is, is that the heavens are opened. It wasn't as though a little tear opened up in the heavens and then the Holy Spirit came out in a dove and kind of squeezed through. That's not what's happening. 
In that moment, the heavens are open and Jesus can now see his father's will, his father's plans, his father's hopes, his father's goals. He's able to perceive spiritual realities and spiritual opportunities. We think we see more than what God sees. Every one of us needs to see what God sees. The heavens are open. Secondly, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. This would have been a very powerful image to Matthew and to those he was writing to because one of the first evidences we have in Scripture of a dove is when Noah was on the ark during the time of flood. One of the things he does is he lets a dove out and the dove comes back with a, a little uh, olive branch. And what it's a symbol of is God is, is restoring and recreating his world. It was a very powerful image. It's also a picture of gentleness. The coming judgment of God is not going to be warlike or come from a vindictive spirit. The anger of man does not produce the righteous life that God desires. I understand our desire to be angry. I don't trust our anger. It's corrupted. Let's leave the anger to God. He gets it right every time. I have the worship team come out. Then there's the voice of the Father. When we put aside our own plans, we find a voice from our Heavenly Father who affirms us. And he's not just saying, that's the price you have to pay for me to be involved in your life. It's just that when we say, I want your will for my life above my will for my life, that brings, that brings a smile to God's face because he knows what's possible once you position yourself like that in his kingdom. We read about how Jesus was conceived by the Spirit. He was born of the Spirit. But now we see him being filled with the Spirit. Perhaps you are aware that you have spiritual life in you. And I'm glad for that. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. But have you been empowered to do what God wants you to do? From the very opening pages of Genesis where we see the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of the deep, to the words that he gives to people to share, to help guide, direct, and sometimes correct his people, to special abilities and gifts that he gives so that people can make a difference in our world. This is what you need to understand about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is how God's kingdom invades our world. And I can tell you right now, our world desperately needs an invasion of his Holy Spirit. So would you bow your heads? Baptism is no small thing. It's a step we take that proves we're willing to walk a different path. Water baptism is soaking wet proof that you're being transformed by grace. It's one of the places you meet God in repentance and in baptism. And if it's something you haven't done, I would encourage you to bury every reason you have for not doing it and make a decision. I will follow God. I want his plan for my life. I think his plan is gonna be way better than my plan. Father, help us learn to live in that trust. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.